Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Anna Mateo, Susan Shand, and Jill Robbins. Later, we will present The Boy on Gravesend Road on American Stories. But first, here is Anna Mateo. As online schooling took effect during the coronavirus pandemic, parents across the United States noted that many children did not have their own learning areas at home. So they got busy. They built, collected, and donated desks. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of students in the U.S., now have workspaces to call their own. Parents say this is helping their children get through long days of online learning at home. One father, named Mitch Couch, lives in Central California. His 16-year-old daughter and 9-year-old son are both studying from home. And they kept taking over the kitchen table for their online school lessons. He said this gave him an idea. He would make them their own desks. After seeing how it helped his family, he had a thought. Why not provide other children with their own desks? Ones that they could decorate with stickers and fun paint. His idea was to show others how to build desks for their children. He made a quick YouTube video to guide parents in desk making. The desks he made were child size, simple, and not costly. Couch said that he built his children's desks for about $20. He made them from plywood. A single piece of plywood, 1.2 meters by 2.4 meters, makes four desks. He also added a built-in area for books and papers. It was a simple structure, but it worked. Leaders of a food store saw his video online. They offered to provide materials if he would build more. They also contacted local school officials to help identify students in need. The first order was for around 20 desks, but it quickly increased at least 50 more. On a recent day, Couch was building more than 10 desks in an area outside of his house. He has made many of these desks, so he can build one in just about 15 minutes. Neighbors stop by to shake his hand. He has received many thank you messages and pictures from parents. Some parents said that their children were doing better and focusing more because they have their own space. I'm Ana Mateo. Last year, Bruce Springsteen was thinking about the death, in 2018, of his friend and former bandmate, George Theis. Springsteen took his guitar and began writing a song about being the last living member of his first band, The Castiles. He wrote about the places in the East Coast state of New Jersey where the young band played their first shows. He described the clothes they wore while they performed. He recalled his first musical experiences, as well as his longtime friends who have died. 
the seventy-one-year-old Springsteen wrote, somewhere deep into the heart of the crowd, I'm the last man standing now. Springsteen named the song Last Man Standing, and more songs followed. He released the resulting album, Letter to You, last week. It was the key to the rest of the record, Springsteen said of Last Man Standing. My friend George passed away. Him and I were the last guys from my first band, which meant it left me sort of on my own. The songs document his difficult friendship with Thice, who formed the Castiles more than sixty years ago. Thice invited Springsteen to join, and he accepted. But quickly Springsteen overtook Thice as the lead musician. Tensions arose, and the band broke up. The two men connected again later in life, but Theis became sick and died. Springsteen said writing about his friend was not easy. In fact, he said, the new song, Ghosts, was quite a storm to write. Ghosts is about his memories of Theis. It is, in Springsteen's words, what it felt like if you had a close friend who you knew all the clothes they wore, the books they read, the records they listened to, and all of those things meant something to you. The twelve-song Letter to You is the musician's twentieth album. It is a look back on the band members and other friends who Springsteen lost. They include Theis, E Street band players Clarence Clemens and Danny Federici, as well as his longtime assistant, Terry McGovern. In the first piece on the album, One Minute You're Here, Springsteen sings about being on his own. And on the last song, I'll See You in My Dreams, he sings that he is ready to meet and live and laugh again with his old friends. Clarence is never out of our thoughts, and neither is Danny. They'll always be in the E Street Band, Springsteen said. The E Street Band came together again to record Letter to You. It was heavy. It was emotional. We've all had to learn our life inside the band and outside the band, how to coexist with the joy of life and the sadness of loss, added E Street Band guitarist Nils Lothgren. They recorded one song every three hours, Springsteen explained. In four days we were done. The fifth day we sat around, drank, and listened to them. The band is at its very best. We've learned our lessons over the years, he added. While recording the songs last November, Apple TV Plus filmed a black-and-white documentary called Bruce Springsteen's Letter to You. It also was released last week. The film is as emotional as the album. At one point, it captures Springsteen's longtime producer, John Landau, crying as he listens to the song, I'll See You in My Dreams. I didn't realize it happened until I saw the film, Springsteen said. I was sitting behind him, and I was just listening to the track and I went, hey, that's pretty good, when it was done. I knew the song was very intense. It's about people who have passed on. Springsteen said he was pleased that Landau agreed to keep the emotional scene in the final version of the film. Springsteen said he wrote nine of the album's songs in about ten days. The other three songs were written almost 50 years ago 
but never recorded, he said. Writing about death, the musician said, has caused him to think differently about life. I'm kind of a little bit thankful for every day that's passing by. I have no regrets about things that I did or didn't do. I had to struggle to get a good personal life together. That took a long time and a lot of work. I'm lucky that I got a great home and a great family right now. I have to thank my lovely wife, Patty Scalfa, for all that, he said. So things are good at the moment. Once you reach my age, death is a part of life. You get in your fifties, sixties, and seventies. It's just a part of living. I'm Susan Shand. Today we answer a question from Donia in Iran. She writes, I am confused about when I can use the possessive nouns. Is it face mask or faces mask? Is it chicken leg or chicken's leg? Thank you. Dear Donia, the examples you asked about are two different ways nouns appear together in English. One is a compound noun, face mask. That is, it is a type of mask used on the face. These days, the compound noun face mask is mostly used in connection with the coronavirus pandemic. But people also wear face masks on certain holidays, including on Halloween. They cover all or part of someone's face as part of a costume. There are many compound nouns in everyday English. Listen to this example. We need to buy cat food for our new pet. The word cat modifies or changes the meaning of the noun food. Here is another example. Bean soup is a good meal in the winter. In this case, we are talking about a soup that includes beans. Now, Let's look at another way two nouns can appear together. You asked about chicken leg and chicken's leg. In the second, you will notice there is an apostrophe, a small mark before the letter S. An apostrophe is used to show possession. Here is an example. My dog's nose is cold. English speakers generally use this way of showing possession when the first noun is either a living thing or a specific thing. Here is an example that relates to your question. Doctor, my chicken's leg was hurt in a fight. Can you help her? In this example, I am talking about a specific chicken. But if I am not talking about one specific chicken's legs, I will use a compound noun to talk about chicken legs in general. The restaurant's specialty is roasted chicken legs. Similarly, if I am talking about dogs in general, I may simply use a compound noun. Dog noses are always cold. That is a statement about all dogs, and not just my own dog. I hope this helps to answer your question, Donya. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Jill Robbins. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, 
visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Kelly Ryan was making dinner. Her 10-year-old son, Benjamin, was watching television in the living room. Or at least she thought he was. Benny boy, do you want black beans or red beans? Red beans, oh, Mama. don't do that, Ben. You scared me half to death. You're going to get it. <laughs> ben had come up quietly right behind her. <laughs> oh, I'll get back to you, you stinker. Kelly goes to the phone. But as soon as she lays her hand on it, the ringing stops. How strange. Oh, the beans. Kelly turns her attention back to cooking. As soon as she does, the phone rings again. Honey, can you get that? Hello? Oh, hi. Yes, I remember. Sure, it sounds fun. Let me ask my mom. Can you hold? She might want to talk to your mom. Uh, oh. Um, okay. See you tomorrow. Ben, your rice and beans are on the table. Let's eat. So, what was that call about? That was Wallace Gray. You know him from class? Mm -hmm. He wants to play tomorrow. Can I go home with him after school? Please, Mom, I get bored around here waiting for you after work. But I don't even know his parents. Maybe I should talk to them. You can't, Mom. He was with his babysitter. He said his parents wouldn't be home until late tonight, and they would leave before he went to school in the morning. Please, Mom, Wallace lives right over on Gravesend Road. It's a five-minute walk from here. Please? Well, okay. What's so great about this guy anyway? You've got a ton of friends to play with. I know, but Wallace is just different. He's got a lot of imagination. The school week passes, and Ben starts to go home almost every day with Wallace. Kelly notices a change in her son. He seems tired and withdrawn. His eyes do not seem to really look at her. They seem lifeless. On Friday night, she decides they need to have a talk. Sweetie... What's going on with you? You seem so tired and far away. Is something wrong? Did you and your new friend have a fight? No, Mom. We've been having a great time. There's nothing wrong with us. Why don't you like Wallace? You don't even know him, but you don't trust him. Benjamin, what are you talking about? I don't dislike Wallace. You're right. I don't know him. You just don't seem like yourself. You've been very quiet the past few nights. I'm sorry, Mom. I guess I'm just tired. I have a great time with Wallace. We play games like cops and robbers. But they seem so real that half of the time I feel like I'm in another world. It's hard to explain. It's like... It's like... I think the word you're looking for is intense? Yeah, that's it. It's intense. Well, tell me about today. What kind of game did you play? We were train robbers, or Wallace was... I was the station manager. Wallace was running through a long train from car to car. He had stolen a lot of money and gold from the passengers. I was chasing right behind him, moving as fast as I could. Finally, he jumps out of the train into the station to make his escape. But I block his path. He grabs a woman on the station platform. She screams, no, no. But he yells, let me through or she dies. So I let him go. What happened then? Well, that's what was weird, and like you said, intense. Wallace threw the lady onto the tracks and laughed. He said that's what evil characters do in the games. They always do the worst. Later, after Ben went to bed, Kelly turned on the 11 o'clock news. She was only half listening as she prepared a list of things to do the next day on Halloween. Okay, let's see. 
Grocery shopping, Halloween decorating. Oh, the dog's got to go to the groomer. The I've got to go to the hardware store, clean up the garden, and the instantly. Reports say it appears she was pushed off the station platform into the path of the oncoming train. No. It happened during rush hour today. Some witnesses reported seeing two boys running and playing near the woman. But police say they did not see any images like that on security cameras at the station. No. In other it news, can't be. The station is an hour away. They couldn't have gotten there. The How power could plant. they? It's just a coincidence. The wind blew low and lonely that night. Kelly slept little. She dreamed she was waiting for Ben at a train station. Then she saw him on the other side, running with another little boy. It must be Wallace, she thought. The little boy went in and out of view. Then, all of a sudden, he stopped and looked across the tracks directly at her. He had no face. Saturday morning was bright and sunny, a cool October day. Kelly made Ben eggs and toast and watched him eat happily. You know, Benny boy... Um, a woman did get hurt at the train station yesterday. She actually got hit by a train. Isn't that strange? She looked at Ben. What do you mean, Mom? Well, you and Wallace were playing that game yesterday about being at a train station. You said he threw a woman off the platform and she was killed by a train. Kelly felt like a fool even saying the words. She was speaking to a ten-year-old who had been playing an imaginary game with another ten-year-old. What was she thinking? I said we played that yesterday. I did? Hmm. No, we played that a few days ago, I think. It was just a really good game. Really intense. Yesterday, we played pirates. I got to be Captain Frank on the pirate ship, the Arg. Wallace was Davy, the first mate. But he tried to rebel and take over the ship, so I made him walk the plank. Davy walked off into the sea and drowned. Wallace told me I had to order him to walk the plank. He said that's what evil pirates do. <laughs> well, I guess he's right. I don't know any pirates, but I do hear they're pretty evil. So can I play with Wallace today when you are doing your errands? Please, Mom, I don't want to go shopping and putting up Halloween decorations. Oh, whatever. I guess so. I'll pick you up at Wallace's house at about um, 5.30 so you can get ready for trick-or-treating. Where does he live again? Graveson Road. I don't know the street number, but there are only two houses on each side. His is the second one on the left. Okay, I can find that easy enough. Do you still want me to pick up a ghost costume for you? Yep. Oh, and guess what, Mom? Wallace says he's a ghost, too. I suppose we'll haunt the neighborhood together. Everywhere Kelly went that day was crowded. She spent an hour and a half just at the market. When she got home, decorating the house for Halloween was difficult. But finally, she had it all up the way she wanted. Oh, oh gosh, it's five already. I don't even have Ben's costume. She jumped into her car and drove to Wilson Boulevard. The party store was just a few blocks away. Kelly soon found the ghost costume that Ben wanted. She bought it and walked out of the store. Hey, Kelly, long time no see. How's Benjamin doing? Eileen, wow, it's great to see you. How's Matt? We've been so busy since the school year started, we haven't seen anyone. Well, Matt's good. I mean, he broke his arm last month, oh. so no sports for him. It is driving him crazy. <laughs> um, but at least he's got a lot of time for school That's now. That's good, yeah. Anyway, anyway, Matt was wondering why Benny Boy never comes by anymore. We saw him running around the neighborhood after school last week. It looks like he's having fun, but he's always alone we don't need to set up a play date ben should know that you just tell him to come by anytime wait, wait, wait a minute alone what do you mean alone he started playing with a new friend a wallace somebody after school like every day this past week ben hasn't been alone uh, wallace gray 
That's it. Do you know him? Does Matt? Oh, Kel- Kelly, I'm sure he's a fine kid. I-, I don't know him, but don't worry. Ben's got great taste in friends. We know that. I'm sure he really wasn't alone. He was probably just playing hide-and-seek or something. I didn't mean to worry you. I guess everybody's on edge because of what happened to the Godwin boy this morning. Kelly suddenly felt cold and scared. What Godwin boy? And what happened to him? She was not sure she wanted to know, but she had to ask. Frank Godwin's youngest boy, Davy, the five-year-old. You know Frank. We call him Captain. He used to be a ship captain. Well, this morning, the rescue squad found Davy in Blackheart Lake. They also found a little toy boat that his dad had made for him. Davy and his dad named it the Arg. Davy must have been trying to sail it. It's so sad. Wait, he's dead? Yes, Davy drowned. Where's Blackheart Lake? It's right off Gravesend Road, right behind that little cemetery. That's why they call it Gravesend. Kelly, where are you going? I've got to get Benjamin. Kelly raced down Main Street. She had no idea who Wallace Gray was or how he was involved in any of this. But she did not trust him, and she knew her child was in danger. Finally, she was at Gravesend Road. Only two houses on each side. She remembered what Ben had told her. Right behind that little cemetery. And what Eileen had told her. Kelly got out of the car and walked down the street. She looked around. The second one on the left. She could see the lake. Some fog was coming up as the sky darkened on this Halloween night. But there was no second house. Instead, what lay before her was grass and large white stones. The cemetery. Kelly walked through the gate into the yard of graves. Ben? No answer. She kept walking. Ben, answer me. I know you're here. Again, no answer. But the wind blew and some leaves began to dance around a headstone. (laughs) Kelly walked slowly toward the grave. Suddenly, the sky blackened so dark she could not see anything. She felt a force pushing at her. It tried to push her away from the grave. But she knew she had to stay. Benjamin Owen Orr, this is your mother. Come out this second. No one answered, except for the sound of the blowing wind. The darkness lifted. Silvery moonlight shone down directly onto the old gravestone in front of her. But Kelly already knew whose name she would see. Wallace Gray. October 31st, 1900 to October 31st, 1910. Some are best when laid to rest. Kelly took a deep breath. Then... Wallace Gray, this play date is over. Give me back my son. Wallace, you are in time out. Suddenly, the ground shoots upward like a small volcano. Soil, sticks, and worms fly over Kelly's head and rain down again, followed by her son, who lands beside her. (coughs) Ben! (coughs) Ben! Mom, Mom, are you there? I can't see all this dirt in my eyes. Ben, I'm here. I'm here, baby. Right here. Oh, sweet Benny boy. Can you breathe? Are you really okay? What happened? How long were you in there? I don't know, Mom, but I didn't like it. I didn't like where Wallace lives. I want to go home. Oh, me so sweetie. Come on. Ben, put your arm around me. Come on. Mom, one more thing. What is it, Ben? I don't want to be a ghost for Halloween. Our story, The Boy on Graves End Road was written and produced by Katie Weaver. The voices were Andrew Bracken, Faith Lapidus, Catherine Cole, Shirley Griffith, and Jim Tedder. I'm Pat Bodner. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.